Dr. Deshner, ladies and gentlemen, it's of course a huge honor and pleasure for me to receive this prize, especially in the name of Karl Heinz Deschner, and of course especially from a foundation named after the immortal Giordano Bruno. Dr. Deschner is a man after my own heart. He does not mince words. No bland platitudes for him. The best way for me to signal my feeling of honor is to reply in similar terms. I have to apologize for speaking in English. I have to apologize for uh, my German is not good enough even to uh, understand the speeches in detail. I didn't follow all of Dr. Deschner's speech, but I watched his face and nobody could mistake the deep and humane sincerity. Sir, it is a singular honor to receive a prize in your name. There is a prize called the Templeton Prize, <laughs> which, uh, as you know, was founded by an extremely rich man uh, who gave his money to any scientist prepared to subvert science and betray the scientific ideals. The only specification of the quantity of the Templeton Prize is that it has to be larger than the Nobel Prize in money. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you today that if I were given a choice between the Templeton Prize and the Deschner Prize, I would go for the Deschner Prize. <laughs> wonderful news that Al Gore has won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Dr. Vukatic began by quoting The Origin of Species uh, and he pointed out that we shouldn't misunderstand Darwin's use of the word creator when he said uh, <coughs> There's grandeur in this view of life with its several parts having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one. It's rather interesting that that phrase, by the Creator, was not present in the first edition of The Origin of Species. It was only added in later editions. Presumably, Darwin was bowing to pressure from the religious lobby, uh, perhaps from his wife. <laughs> Dr. schmidt Salomon kindly sent me a, a previous draft of his speech, and I learned much from it. I think the bit that I particularly learned from didn't make it into the final version, but I was very struck by his drawing attention to the incongruous mismatch between the scientific worldview that underlies the design and construction of a modern jet airliner and the Bronze Age barbarian worldview, from the point of view of the, from, from, from another point of view, an infantile worldview, of the men who hijacked those marvels of science and propelled them into two of the tallest buildings in the world, themselves marvels of science-based technology. It's easy to regard those 19 men, the murderers of September the 11th, 2001, as evil barbarians. That's the view taken by Bush. Even today, I cannot bring myself to call him President Bush. <laughs> In the inf 
infernal smoke and dust of that terrible day. Fanciful imaginations short thought they could discern the face of the devil, Satan himself, the very personification of evil, and the rumor raced around the internet. But I hope I shall not give offense if I say that those 19 men were not evil. By the lights of their own religion, they were righteous, good, striking a blow for Allah, securing for themselves a fast track to paradise by martyring themselves for Allah. An alarmingly high percentage of young Muslims living in Britain agree with them. If we extrapolate from those figures for British Muslims, it seems quite likely that millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people in this world believe it follows from their cherished religious faith that to murder 3,000 New York office workers was the right, the good, the dutiful thing to do. They believe that the 19 men, whom we regard as unforgivable thugs and barbarians, the epitome of evil, are even now relaxing by the ever-flowing streams of the gardens of paradise, being served and granted their every wish by dark-eyed maidens. These 19 men, and others like them, were not uneducated, not stupid. Some of them were trained as engineers. They knew some mathematics, physics, scientific method. The men who plotted the more recent suicide missions in Britain were doctors. Their heads were filled with detailed facts about anatomy, physiology, cellular biochemistry. They knew the precise anatomical details of the arms and legs that they hoped to sever from bodies, their own included. They had good brains, capable of passing difficult medical examinations. But those good brains had been hijacked by faith, just like an airliner hijacked by terrorists. They're not stupid. They're not unpleasant people to know. After the London bombings of the 7th of July 2005, the British newspapers were full of stories of the astonishment of the neighbours and acquaintances of the bombers. These were nice, decent young men, friendly, worked in youth clubs, loved playing cricket. They were not social misfits, but friendly young men, the sort of young man you'd enjoy spending an evening with. But nice as they were, their brains had been hijacked by a terrible parasite, the virus called religious faith. Daniel Dennett, my colleague, by the way, Daniel Dennett made a delightful remark to me when the subject of the Templeton Prize came up in Faustian vein. He said to me about the Templeton Prize, Richard, if ever you fall on hard times. <laughs> Dan Dennett used an example, a biological example, which I don't mind stealing back from him because he acknowledges that he stole it from me in the first place. <laughs> it's the example of the so-called brain worm, a fluke, that lives in ants. And it uh, burrows into the brain of the ant and makes a tiny little lesion in the brain of the ant. And as you know, if you make a lesion in a brain of an animal, you can change its behavior. And what this fluke does, what this parasite does, is to make a lesion in the brain of the ant that changes its behavior in a way that benefits the fluke. It causes the ant Instead of going down into the ground in the heat of the day, which would be the normal thing for the ant to do, it causes the ant to climb to the top of a grass stem, where it becomes vulnerable to being eaten by a sheep, which is exactly what the fluke, quote, wants to happen, because the sheep is the uh, final host in the life cycle of this parasite. 
The biological literature is full of such beautiful, from one point of view, examples of parasites hijacking their hosts, manipulating their hosts to their own advantage. The human brain, unfortunately, seems horribly vulnerable to being hijacked in this kind of way. Religions are masters of the hijacker's art. I don't know, genuinely don't know, whether they are deliberately crafted to this end by ingenious priests, or whether they have evolved their hijacking efficiency by something equivalent to Darwinian natural selection. It's an interesting question, I shall leave it on one side. The fact remains that brains are perfectly competent, that brains that are perfectly competent at living a life in the high-tech 21st century, brains that can do mathematics and anatomy, engineering and physiology, brains that can mediate nice, friendly behavior, running a youth club, playing cricket, can be hijacked by a Bronze Age mind virus that drives them to do the most appalling deeds, made all the more appalling by modern technology. There is something both bizarre and inherently dangerous about faith. It means believing something without evidence. And don't tell me your faith is based on evidence, because if it were, you wouldn't need to call it faith. Evidence would be enough. Of course, I believe in all sorts of things that some people might think were based on faith. For example, the love of my wife. But that is based on evidence. Subtle evidence, clues, looks in the eye, catches in the voice. You see the evidence every day of your life and it slowly builds up confidence. That is not faith. There's no point in having faith if you have evidence. When two people disagree in science, and we do of course disagree, it's because of the interpretation of evidence or it's because there's not yet enough evidence. You'll never hear a scientist say something like this. I believe in X because I'm a Big Bang theorist. And we Big Bang theorists, as opposed to steady state theorists, believe X. In my own field, you'll never hear anybody say, I believe Y because I'm a group selectionist. And we group selectionists believe so-and-so. Scientists say, I believe so-and-so because that is where the evidence leads. I am a big banger because the evidence supports the Big Bang Theory. I am against group selection because the evidence goes against group selection. Don't think for a moment, by the way, that scientists are completely confident that they know everything. Science does not mean scientism. There's plenty of disagreement among scientists, and there's plenty that scientists admit that they don't know. There may be plenty that science can never know. But don't let anyone run away with the totally illogical idea that because science can't answer some deep and mysterious question, therefore religion can. Einstein may be partly to blame here because Einstein loved to use the word God as a sort of poetic metaphor for expressing the deeply mysterious and beautiful mysteries that still confront science. But Einstein, for example, when Einstein said God doesn't play dice, he meant that he, was, he didn't believe in Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. When Einstein said, did God have a choice in designing the universe? He meant, is there more than one way for a universe to be? Or is there only one kind of conceivable universe? He used God as a metaphor for the deep mysteries of science. He emphatically did not believe in God. I quote from Einstein. It was, of course, a lie what you read about my religious convictions. A lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world, so far as our science can reveal it. 
in the Einsteinian sense, I too am a deeply religious man. People often accuse me of failing to discriminate good religion from bad. I'm accused of attacking all religion. And I should concentrate my fire on the extreme, not the decent, moderate, middle of the road, mainstream of bishops and priests and mullahs. Maybe there is something in that criticism. But on the other hand, I think the decent, moderate, mainstream are not free of blame. Suicide bombers' minds may have been hijacked under the immediate influence of extremist or unscrupulous mullahs. But those minds were prepared for hijacking in childhood, when they were trained to believe that faith, belief without evidence, was a virtue. They learned in their infant schools. They were taught not by mad extremist mullahs, but by decent, moderate, middle-of-the-road religious teachers, teachers who themselves wouldn't hurt a fly. The vast majority of people who are taught in infancy that faith is a virtue do not end up as suicide bombers, but it only takes a few. And without childhood indoctrination about the virtues of faith and about the particular faith of the culture, whether it's faith in Allah or faith in Jesus, the later attempts at hijacking would have nothing to hold on to and would fail. Children are indoctrinated to believe that faith is a virtue. But where does the initial indoctrinability of children come from in the first place? I think in an indirect sense it comes from our evolutionary past. As an evolutionary biologist, I'm often asked to explain the evolutionary advantages of religion, and it is true that any Darwinian finds it a challenge to explain anything that's universal in a species in Darwinian terms, just as sexual desire is a universal in the human species, despite the fact that not everybody has it or not everybody has heterosexual desire. In just the same way, religion is a human universal, even though not all of us actually are religious. All cultures have had religion at one time or another. So it is a Darwinian challenge to explain why humans have this predilection to be religious. And I rather favor an explanation in terms of the child brain. I'm one of those who goes for the so-called byproduct theory of religion according to which religion itself doesn't have any biological Darwinian survival value, but it's a byproduct of a psychological predisposition which, in another way, in another sphere, does have a biological advantage. And childhood indoctrinability, childhood credulity, may be just such an origin, just such a psychological predisposition an origin of a byproduct, as a byproduct, religion. Child brains are set up to obey and believe their parents and respected elders. If a child didn't believe what it was told by its elders, it would die. A human child is vulnerable in a, in a wild state and it needs to, to heed warnings, not to jump over cliffs, not to jump in the fire, not to bathe in the river where there might be crocodiles. So the child brain comes into the world pre-programmed with a rule, believe whatever you're told by parents or other respected elders. And the problem with a rule of thumb like that is that it's vulnerable to misuse, it's vulnerable to hijacking, it's vulnerable to parasitization. Just as a computer, cannot be built to do good things, to be programmable to do good things like word processing and spreadsheets without at the same time automatically being potentially programmable by a computer virus which does bad things. You cannot design a computer which is capable of being in a versatile way programmed and which is not capable of being programmed by a computer virus. In the same kind of way, the child brain which comes into the world pre-programmed 
to believe whatever it's told by its elders is automatically vulnerable to believing nonsense because there's no mechanism, how could there be, for discriminating the sense, like don't bathe in the river with the crocodiles, from the nonsense, like any religious doctrine you care to mention. I don't want to end on a negative note, so I want to end in a more uplifting way. The world is a beautiful place. We are privileged to have woken up in it. I want to read the opening paragraphs of a previous book of mine, not The God Delusion, but Unweaving the Rainbow. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place but who will in fact never see the light of day outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. Here is another respect in which we are lucky. The universe is older than a hundred million centuries. Within a comparable time, the sun will swell to a red giant and engulf the earth. Every century of hundreds of millions has been in its time, or will be when its time comes, the present century. The present moves from the past to the future like a tiny spotlight, inching its way along a gigantic ruler of time. Everything behind the spotlight is in darkness, the darkness of the dead past. Everything ahead of the spotlight is in the darkness of the unknown future. The odds of your centuries being the one in the spotlight are the same as the odds that a penny tossed down at random will land on a particular ant crawling somewhere along the road from New York to San Francisco. I am lucky to be alive, and so are you. Privileged, and not just privileged to enjoy our planet. More, we are granted the opportunity to understand why our eyes are open and why they see what they do in the short time before they close forever. Thank you very much.